Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived entirely to let me spend more time than I'd ever get on the radio with fascinating people. Um, this week's guest, Dame Sheila Hancock. Oh. I have, I have, I've, I've tried this line with a couple of previous guests, but I think in your case it's especially pertinent. There's quite a lot to get through. Well, as you're going to do my whole life. I mean, the thing is that I've forgotten most of it. So I'm not the best person to interview. I keep I keep hearing things. Like I listen to Radio 4 Extra sometimes, mm. and they do old plays. And I swear to God, I listened to an entire play, not being able to sleep, about 3 o'clock yes. in the morning. I thought, oh, that's quite good. And at the end it said, Judith was played by Sheila Hancock. <laughs> no, just I don't remember a single thing about it, and I'd have been in a terrible state when I did it because I always got nervous about everything. But, but you not you don't recognise your own voice I, while you're I, listening. In to fact, it. so much so. And then there was another one, an Ian e. Foster series. <laughs> yes. Somebody phoned up and said, "I'm really enjoying you in the Foster," and I said, "No, no, that's not me. That's somebody else." And I tuned in. And I didn't recognise myself, Nothing so yet. much so that I asked my agent to phone them and say, I think you've put my name on something that I'm not <laughs> in. Again, four-part <laughs> series, and I don't remember a thing about Good it. Good Lord. And just very briefly, do you remember Dudley Sutton? Yes, he, I did. He, he told me a story many moons ago about, I think he was actually in hospital, and only when I laugh came on. But remember, do you remember yes, the James Bolam, and they were set in a hospital, and he phoned his agent. And it's very cross because he said, why on earth haven't you put me up for this? It's perfect. It has a revolving cast. And his agent said, you were in the last series. You, 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 you had... It is <laughs> awful, isn't it? <laughs> I think but that... I mean, quite honestly, I, on, I really, somebody did a programme of, um, on Friday mm. about me and, and I honestly had forgotten a lot of it. But you can't possibly, you learn lines. I think my brain, when I was in Weekly Rep, I think I had an automatic wipeout yes. because your brain just can't take yes. so much. I mean, Giles Brandis says it's all there. And if I ever forget things, he always makes me remember it because he says that all that's happened is you've got lazy about re recovering right. yes, it. yes. But, but your brain is full of everything. So, you know, mine must be crammed with the worst plays in the world. Well, at least you have your own memoirs to consult now if you, are, yes, if you do true. need to clarify anything. That is true. I do that. <laughs> I've been known to do that for dates. <laughs> I have, really. Uh, it begins in on the Isle of Wight, mm. uh, but not for very long, I don't think. No, I think it, I honestly don't know, I don't know much about my childhood and I've, I've got nobody alive to tell me, but... I think my dad was working there in, there was an old hotel in Black Gang Chine. Mm. It's now a huge funfair place, but then it was just this rather isolated hotel. And I was born while he was working there. And then I think we left immediately and we went to a pub somewhere in Berkshire. Right. But they claim me as an islander, as do. they call it. Yes. And your dad was Italian, originally. He was born in Italy yes. and he was given the name of Enrico and the... The rumour hath it that Enrico Caruso was his godfather. And actually, when they did my Who Do You Think You Are, I mean, we thought it was laughable. But the, my my grand, my granddad worked for, what's the big travel firm? Thomas Cook. Thomas Cook, who at that time were kind of like ambassadors. Yes. They were terribly important. Yes. And, they, and they took me on that programme to a place that they lived in Milan, which is an incredibly glamorous flat. And he obviously would have entertained a lot of people. So it's conceivable that Enrico Caruso thought, oh, God, if I'm going to get a good train, I'll have to give something, you know, or say. Keep so sweet. I've got this little pot with his name on. Family legend. Yeah. Um, so well, he, wasn't, he wasn't Italian. He was just born there. He was or, just born there. Oh, OK. So but he spoke granddad... only Italian when he was little. Growing up. Were you conscious of that when you were little? Or, or... No, I wasn't. I wasn't really. I mean... I I mean, he was temperamentally not like normal people. So the fact that he had a name like Enrico, may, but of course they called it Rick during the war because right. it wasn't good to be Italian no, during the war. No, of course, of course. Um, but it, it um, I, I mean, he, he was kind of melodramatic and operatic and he used to sing in the bar, <laughs> Pagliacci, would you believe, in King's Cross. Can you believe? This is where, where he had a pub, yeah, Latterly, right. after Berkshire. Yeah. So is this where do your earliest memories kick in then? Because the, I think the war broke out when you were six. Yes, seven. Seven. I, think. Um, I can remember a pub that we worked in Berkshire. And then 
King's Cross is the one I remember the most because I was happiest there. It was lovely. Um, and that's where they had a piano in the bar and it was a real local pub. And actually, funnily enough, it's still not been turned into a smart okay. sort of thing. I mean, it's not like it was when I was there, but it's still got a public bar and a saloon bar. Right. hasn't got the ladies' bar, but it, it and it's got some of the cracked mirrors. And I hope they don't change it because there's very few of those left now. Why were you happy there? What, what was it you liked? I don't know. I Just the atmosphere and the... Salvation Army used to come on a Sunday and it was a very working class pub and um, I just felt we lived in the flat above which is what we always did we weren't allowed in the bar because sure. children weren't had to run through but but I just I just felt comfortable in that area it was an incredibly friendly area you've got siblings you've got I've got a sister who was um, nine years older than me oh, okay. so I so didn't more, really more like have much to do with her, yeah. To you. Um, and, and your mum didn't work in the pub, I don't think. She, worked she did, in, yes, she did. she did. And also in a department store. Yeah, but when they left the pub, I think Dad was too keen of the sort of have one on me, Rick, things. Um, and they moved, and we then moved to Kent. Right. And my mum worked in a shop in Erith, and a big store in Erith, and Dad worked in a factory right. in Crayford. This uh, is basically Armstrong. This is, this is this is sort of suburban, really. Yeah. So quite different, buzz, yes. buzz-wise. Yes, I hated it. Did I you? absolutely hated it. You but remember hating it? I mean, quite I young. I remember hating, finding it terribly dull and having to behave, you know, because it was sort of semi-detached houses and... You had to behave nicely, and I wasn't used to that because in the pub I could do more or less what I liked, you know, yes. because my mum and dad worked all the hours at God's End. Mind you, they did when they were working in the shop and everything. But um, And I was a bit older there, yes. and then I, I was at grammar school, so I had a lot of homework and I had to work hard, so it was a different life. Were you, were you a good pupil? Were you, did you like school? Um, I don't know about liking it. But I worked for really, really hard. I was on a scholarship because it was before you could go free to grammar schools. Mm. The Education Act came in just after I went there, so I had to have a scholarship to go there. And very few people got them. And uh, me and... We were a class of 50 at our primary school, and only five of us got to the grammar school. Gosh. And the rest all had to go to secondary moderns and texts, which were awful, absolutely awful. Yes. And, you know, I've done, I've done literary festivals... And I often talk about it, and I've had people come up and say, I remember that. I was one of the people that was bunged off to secondary modern, and I never got over it. You know, because... So early, isn't it, to be judged, to be sifted? Absolutely, that you were a failure, you hadn't got your scholarship. And it's shameful. Who, who, which was the aspirational parent then? Which one I think they both were. They they were. Both, because, I mean, looking back on them, they were... I mean, my mum would have been an amazing businesswoman, but she left school at, I think, 14. And, mm. um, But, you know, when she worked in the shop in Erie, she started on the glove counter. <laughs> and then she suggested to the man who ran it that they have a little library because she heard that some shops did. So she set that up. And then she said, well, what about a restaurant? So they had a big cafe there. And i tell you who it was. It was Wendy Cope's father no. who owned the shop. Wendy really? Cope was a little girl there. Yeah. yeah. But my, but I always thought my mum, with no education at all, mm. did all that. And it was her. It was her that really got it going. So, so were you a sort of vessel, do you think, for her frustrated ambitions in any way? I, or was that cod psychology? I, she was very frightened always for me. Right. I mean, she was... I mean, I remember getting a letter when I was out of work in London and I was with my first husband. And I got a letter from her saying, you, must, you mustn't you must neglect your husband. You're not taking care of him in the way that you should. You're too ambitious. Mm. There are other things in life and your family and this, that and the other. And they were very frightened. And, and rather sadly, I went through the records at RADA one day many years later when I was filming there. And there was a letter from my dad written beautiful handwriting and everything saying could you let us know whether you think Sheila has a future in this oh. because we're a bit worried about where she's going to go you know? and so obviously they were really worried that I wasn't going to have a solid job. From a job. place of profound love and concern. Yeah yeah and and in those days coming from that background yes 
people did have jobs from when they left school sure. for life. Now yes. everybody moves on all the time. I, I mean, because for an outsider, you'd think getting into RADA would have been proof enough that you had. Well, yes, faced. again a scholarship, yes. again a scholarship, um, and I was very out of my depth there. They were right about that, but it was. I don't know. I think I, they they weren't sure that I'd made the no. right choice it seemed no risky one, they can't write a check for you though can they no. no one can especially in your profession no one can guarantee anything you, but you these know. are the same people that after the war immediately after the war let me go hitchhiking all around europe so they must have been terrified so concern for your long-term security if not your yes. short-term safety well they seem different... me off evacuated yes you know, well that, mean, so, so we've, we've jumped ahead let's had... go back to that that was a, 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 sort of at the outbreak of war really when you were you were evacuated um, miles away from home. It's it's one of the sort of what's it? What was the story that John did? That your late husband did? Was it Uncle? Oh uh, yes, yes, yes so, Uncle Mr. Tom. Mr. Tom. Some of yeah. us probably rely more on fiction for understanding the experience of evac evacuation than we do on yes, fact well, he, and memoir. I, we talked a lot about it when he did it. I told him what it was like. And yes. How it was. I thought it was wonderful, and I thought he was brilliant in it's it. It's superb. Piece. Absolutely wonderful, timeless, timeless sh show. But you've said that the other children, when you got to Wallingford in Oxfordshire, the other children didn't like the evacuation. Oh, they hated us. They hated us. I mean, I can understand them hating us. I mean, we had Cockney accents. <laughs> we couldn't understand them, and they couldn't understand us. And we were we did have fleas. Quite a lot of us. <laughs> <laughs> I had fleas. I got the cane actually. I had. I had. They used to do flea parade, and used to teacher used to look at our hair which she had a, th a sort of glass thing and she looked at our hair and if you had knits you had your sh hair washed in yeah. the show in the cloakroom in front of all the other gir girls in a sort of carbolic thing yeah yeah it would be anyway she wanted me to wash and i i pushed her and hit her well, so i got the cane <laughs> were you quite a rebellious child generally or i was just defending myself yeah. i spent most of the time terrified you know but i i would people have known you were terrified? Would your exterior have been quite robust? No, because I I would fight them back. But but I had a twitch. I had you know because of the raids. I think I had I I had a really bad twitch, and they thought I was pulling faces to them, mm. and 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 just I was very feeble looking. I was right. very thin, and um, so I was I was game. I mean, you know, it happens now. One of my one of my grandchildren is going through a bullying thing now. Oh dear. And I think kids are pretty savage. Yes, they can. We be. have to learn to be civilized, don't we? I yes. think our basic instinct is to be quite cruel, mm. and and what we have to do is learn to be kind. But you're describing trauma, though, especially if you had a tick or a twitch. It's I mean, you, and in those days, it wouldn't have been diagnosed or treated or anything like that. No, God, no. I mean, I I got I get so fed up with all this. Oh, he's got PDSI or STIB or something, yes. and he's taking lovely pills for it. And you think, no, he's just naughty. He's just being naughty. Tell him to behave. Um, and did you did you start behaving when you? I did. I mean, I I have a lot of sympathy for gangs now. I do. I do some work with kids, and I got in a gang. Right. That was our defence, you know, and it was partly evacuees, but some of the naughtier. Local yes. kids. Yes. I remember I told stories. We used to go to a haystack. And I always did this game of you give me three subjects, I still do it, and you make a story up round it. Yeah. And I don't think anybody had ever done that to them. So they used to say, do you, want, do you want to come and tell us a story? So they used to sit on this haystack and do that. So I got sort of friendly with them and a gang. And I have to say, I I did shoplift. I did, I did fight back. I'm a Quaker now, but I mean, I did... I, I remember one occasion, there was a, a thing called the crinny, which you, you had to run across a piece of green area where going to school and coming back from school. And that was where they used to wait for me and pounce on me, these local kids who hated me. And uh, anyway, they got me one day and they did that thing of forming a circle and they push you from one side mm. of the circle to the other until you fall over and then a bit of kicking goes on. Anyway, they were doing that to me. And along came, and I've always doted on women like this ever since, a kind of middle class, rather lovely lady. Said, what's, what's going on here? <laughs> Stop this. How dare you do that? 
Don't, now, you come with me, darling. I'll, I'll take you home. Where are you, where are you living? And, and this woman absolutely rescued me. Gosh. And, you know, I've always had a load of time for women like that who get things done. Yes. It's rather like the post office story. Yes, now. it is. There yes. are generations of these solid ladies, usually yes. in cardigans, <laughs> who, who don't allow... Miss, you know, just do it. Just clean it up. Uh, uh, what, what were the couple you were billeted with like? Uh, well, what? they were a very old couple with mm. a little Pekingese dog that bit me. And they... They had never had children. No. They, I was forced on them. They didn't want to take a billet. And um, and I just landed in the house. And uh, and I don't think they knew what to do with this twitchy, frightened child. And there were some cows, I remember, down the bottom of the garden. And I'd never seen cows. And I was... I still am terrified of cows, and you should be terrified. Yes, I know of cows. it's a great They're point. Bloody dangerous! But they really are, and every year there's a couple of terrible stories. Absolutely, people laugh when you say you're ther- cows are huge. Absolutely, yes. I say this to my family. Good. They all walk through, and I say, "You wait, <laughs> I'm going around the edge. I go miles around." But anyway, it was all pretty awful, and then I dirtied the bed the first night oh, I was dear. there because there was this awful toilet at the end of the garden that I I was frightened of, and. But eventually, I mean, you learn. Yes. Whatever happens, you you learn. You learn to cope, and you learn who you can befriend with, and and eventually. And you found safety in numbers. That's what you mean when you say you have sympathy yeah. for gangs. Is that yeah. you stop being a victim when you become a member of a group? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And and yeah, and you face it together. I mean, that's what we've got to do about everything. We've got to face it together. That's why you know Brexit and all those things have upset me because. We talk, we're talking division all the time. Mm. And this world is only ever going to be the perfect place I want it to be I, if we all talk to one another. It, it, it's with, with, with the perspective of, of, that you have, being born in 1933 and mm. being old enough to, 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 to know roughly what was going on in the water, old enough to be traumatised by it, old oh, enough absolutely. to know that you've been evacuated. Absolutely. Uh, I, th- I mean, some of the stuff that you've written and some of the stuff that you've said about, about politics, it... it it, it resonates with a, a sense of almost disbelief that we seem to have gone backwards yeah. in some ways. Yeah. It seemed, I mean, I, even after coronavirus, I thought, oh, God, this is wonderful. Mm. This is going to be a new beginning. We found one another yeah. again. Yeah. We're supporting one another. We're doing things together. And I do think that people are finding a voice now. Yes. You know, every weekend there are marches going on. The Iraq march was one of the biggest ones. It doesn't work because the government is still saying, the British people are telling us. Mm-hmm. They're not. No, they're really they're not. not. No. I don't know who they're listening to, but no. after stuff, they're not. But, you know, I think my profession as well. I mean, it's amazing what's happened with that post office series. It's something that's been going on for years. Mm. I mean, I'm sure you've been following it in yes. private eye. Yes, I have. didn't touch. Thinking, it's... why hasn't yeah. why isn't somebody doing something about this? And then you get one series on the thing, and I think it's our duty. I feel very strongly in our in our world that we have to start doing that. So, well, some people were were a bit sniffy about it. They were not about the drama, but about the failure of the public to appreciate the scale of the scandal until it was turned... I'm, I'm the opposite. I suspect you are as well. That's precisely what stories are But nobody are for. ever tells anybody the truth mm. anymore. No. It's like almost everything in politics. You know, whenever we talk about taxation, I'm, I'm going to get nasty people things, saying things now, but if we only explain to people that, A, the whole lot are not going to be taxed because most people are not liable for taxes, mm, of course. but... If we paid more in taxes, we wouldn't have to send children to private school. We wouldn't have to go to private medicine, as everybody is beginning to do now. I I went to a private doctor because I needed an urgent appointment. Mm. So that was the only way I could see... It creates necessity. Absolutely. Mm. And I think directly you explain to the public clearly and absolutely honestly. That's what happened after the war. That's what happened. We were wrecked after the war. Mm. We were bankrupt. We were tired. We had men coming back from the war and the prison camps absolutely destroyed. We had children trying to get used to men that they hadn't seen for years. It was mayhem. But there was this vision. There was this vision that it could be better. And then the national health happened. And my dad, who had TB, we could afford to go to the doctor's. Do you know? And, and I got the, a lot of other people joined me at grammar school. Right, yes. So it change happened. And 
I think people are, would be only too willing to pay a few pounds extra in tax if we could improve our schools. Our schools are in a disgraceful state at the moment. And we are going to be cutting now. I hear on the related thing on the radio is that the council tax, they're going to give give some sort of generous thing in the latest um, handouts. Yes. But the councils are going to have to put up their taxes because they're paying for all those things. 40, 40 MPs, Tory MPs today asking for their count, their councils to get to get more money. It's funny how the really? world turns. Yes. Really? Well, Were you ever tempted by politics, like more formally? I was, I was, but I couldn't follow a party whip. You know, I... I I really couldn't vote for something I absolutely didn't believe in. Mm. And our political system as it is wouldn't work if you don't. Couldn't accommodate. If you're not you. loyal to your party, mm. you know. Um, so you come back to London from from, uh, from Wallingford. That's roughly coincides almost with the get, get, doing getting into grammar school, getting getting the scholarship, yeah. going to grammar school. Yeah. When when did the when did the bug bite? When did the thespian bug bite? Well. My mum and dad usually were entertained in the pub, so I was used to that. My sister went to Italia Conti's okay. and was in Ensa during the war um, and was a dancer and a singer and everything. Um, and I, I, So that was at the back of my mind. And the opportunities were so little when I was young for women of, like me from my background, even though I went to grammar school mm. and even though, dare I say, I was clever. And my teachers wanted me to go for something called a state scholarship at that time, which would have paid my fees to go to a university. And they reckoned I could get in. But I just thought it was school. I remember there was no television in those days. So I didn't know what university was. Right, Honestly, gosh, I yes. didn't. It just sounded like another few years of school. I thought it was more school. If yes. somebody had had the sense to take me and show me Oxford and Cambridge and things, that might have changed things. But I... I, the only people I knew who'd been to university were my teachers. Right. Nobody in the world that I knew had been to university. Gosh. So I couldn't say, what's it like to no, anybody? And mum and dad wouldn't know either, really. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No. <laughs> no way. They were frightened of it, too. So, you know, I, it's one of my biggest regrets that I didn't go, because I then, years, years later, I, I was a chancellor of Portsmouth University. Yes. And I, I just was so joy, overjoyed seeing people arrive as freshers and see how they gained confidence and got to learn about the world. Some people coming from places that they'd never left when they were young. Of course. And yeah. suddenly they're meeting from people from all over the world and learning new things. And it's, it's wonderful. Um, but I, I didn't know what it was. And then I did... <laughs> It's so shameful, but it's true, and I've told the story before, and it's absolutely true. <laughs> I was madly in love with this bloke called Alan Coast, who was one of the science six from the grammar school across the way, and they right. used to use our laboratories and come over. And this godlike man used to come <laughs> over and use it. And I, w I used to go by on bell duty, hoping that he would even glance in my direction, <laughs> you know, but he didn't. And then... I did St. Joan in the school play. Right. And a couple of days later... But the, the title role? Yeah. So, okay. yeah, so we jumped ahead sure. a little bit then, because you must have... You don't get cast as St. Joan unless you've demonstrated some aptitude. Well, I'd done, or did you? I hadn't done a lot. We no? didn't do a lot. But I, I think I'd read sonnets and things yeah. in class. And my teachers, these are the same teachers that begged my parents to let me go to, to state university. school. So, right, you are. State. To um, university. And I think they probably, like John, had the same thing. He yes. had teachers that encouraged him because he'd never heard of Rada. Beyond the, the horizons that you would otherwise That's have lived absolutely, within. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you um, did St. Joan. You smashed it. I did St. Joan, yes. <laughs> and I think I probably was quite good because people since, most of them have died now, but remember having seen it. And um, anyway, a couple of days later, bell duty, tap on the window, beckoned over, asked to go to the school dance by Alan Coast. Wow. So, so you thought, reached parts that... <laughs> oh, what? This is my future. Are you kidding with that? Lovely, blonde Alan Coast for the rest of my life. But then an awful thing happened because they did my Who Do You Think You... No. Yes. What's that thing where you they tell you your life? This is your life. Oh, yes, of course. And they did my This Is Your Life. And I'd all 
bored John rigid about this bloke. All I'd always said, you know, you're you're quite good looking, but well, you're no was Alan Close. <laughs> he was so handsome. Anyway, lo and behold, he says, and now I, we see your early love, Alan Coase. And on came this slightly balding gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so deeply embarrassed I'm sure he was he was very game about it awfully sweet he was living in Africa and he'd been dragged over really? for Gosh. this joke so no Adonis but anymore. you know these terribly good looking I've just been reading Death in Venice yes. a marvellous book and there's not, nothing better than a beautiful man is there I know what you mean well you won't know no, but I do but... know what you mean I think I've, well, I've, have you watched The Bear yet the the, the TV show about no. the um, about the chef in Chicago who, no oh there's a very beautiful man in that really yes he's just won all the Emmys it's, uh, really? and there is something well, there's a reason why they made statues out of them and thousands the of Greeks, years ago didn't the they it goes yeah. back far enough but he was he was breathtakingly lovely <laughs> So apart from Alan Coast, mm. did did performing in in Shaw's St Joan okay. did it did I mean did it did you find just did you find muscles you didn't know you had did you feel things you hadn't felt before was there a sort of moment of yes I suppose I would I've got a terrible confession for to make that I have never really enjoyed <laughs> acting because I I've always suffered from terrible stage yes. fright crucifying stage fright and it started with St Joan really because I did one performance of it and I think a lot of people said it was good yes which hadn't occurred to me right um and I remember years later when I worked for Joan Littlewood who was a revelation to everybody but I had a big success in a in a, a show called Make Me an Offer mm. lots of reviews and things saying overnight bullshit and all that <laughs> and the following night I was terrified standing in the wings absolutely terrified and I felt these arms round me and it was Joan and she was saying and she whispered in my ear and she said darling you're in a nasty dark forest full of beasts and frightening things and on there is light and loveliness and then shoved me on the, stage. on the stage and it was a wonderful thing I've, I've used it ever since when I've been scared of thinking of but the I think most actors who get stage fright, and most actors do of get course, stage fright, yes. is that we assume the audience are going to hate us. And certainly on first nights, we assume the critics are going to hate us. Mm. And Jones' thing was saying, no, actually, out there is love. And certainly in my entire career, I know that to be true. Yes. There is enormous love. It can change overnight if you say something wrong. Of but, course. But well, there is a generosity of spirit from audiences. People want to like what they're they watching. They do. They've they paid a lot of money. You know, apart from critics, perhaps. Most people turn up wanting to enjoy they do. They what they're seeing. So you have to... But then you, you're tortured with the thought that you don't want to let them down. Yes. I remember you've done it a hundred times. And yes. you've got to make it seem it's but, the but first time. But they haven't seen it a hundred times. It's the they've first. seen it. So it's quite challenging. Where, where do you find the joy then? Where, where, where if you don't, if you're frightened before, are you in a moment? Uh, Douglas Adams, the author, described the, it as throwing yourself at the at the floor and missing. You just sort of soar off into a place that you can't really visit in any other way except by being in the moment. I don't know. I don't. I mean, that when some nights a show takes off, for want of yes. a better word, and you're all of you part of it. I, th I think the thing I most enjoy is rehearsals. Mm. I love the exploration of a character. I and like the collaboration. turning myself into a person. Yes. Do you yes. know what I mean? Yes. Finding the feet and the head and their life and research. I mean, when people laugh about lovies, mm. what they don't realise is that when we work, we go into people's minds in a way that the average person never does. Mm. So we have an understanding of how people are suffering and all that. So we're maybe a bit over compassionate, or over em empathetic. Yeah, yes. yeah. But I, uh, yeah, I, I, I love that process. I lo particularly with a good director, and I, my fellow actors. I love all the laughs and the fun yes. for that. I, I like being in musicals better than plays because I like the band and I love. I love the chorus and everybody. They're all, always fun to be with. It's like being on a an aircraft carrier rather than a yacht, I imagine. It's like there's stuff going See, on over yes. here and stuff. There's all but also of... you get these amazingly close relationships. Yes. And the minute you, the last curtain goes, it's over. Yes. But then 10 years later, you go, oh, hello, we were 
doing such and such together. Lovely. Hug, hug, hug. It's an extraordinary thing. I don't think it happens in any other profession. I don't think people in offices, no. on the whole, have scenes where they jump into bed and have sex on the first day of the <laughs> office, you know, which is what we sometimes oh, I don't know. do. Um, but this, I mean, on stage. No, I, no, I, I, I understand. Yeah. I understand. And I, I mean, for people who don't know, and there won't be many of them, you, you have you, you, you've done the lot. You've done the farces, the Carry On films, the jo- working with Joan Littlewood. Yeah. Um, work. I mean, the Pinter, the Shaw, all of it. You've done the whole canon, really. But it, it, you've already mentioned, if we backtrack slightly, that Rada was not a happy experience for no. you. So there's no indication yet of what might follow. It's never been the most important thing in my life. I right. mean, that's a dreadful thing to say. Not really. But I care, I'm now particularly, I care so much about the world. Mm. Before I die, I want to do as much as I can to try and make it better for my grandchildren. But I... I it's always seemed more important yes. and therefore I I mean for instance my, my best thing ever was when I was artistic director of the Royal Shakespeare tour and we went to Belfast during the Troubles mm. we went to the mines during the miners strike and we were part of society and we were doing plays that they didn't know but were totally relevant yes. doing Romeo and Juliet in Belfast at the height of the Troubles oh, wow. was the best thing it's a sectarian I've ever done. play isn't it absolutely when you think about it absolutely it's... and the recur- when we finished I think there was a silence of about five minutes wow. and then the audience just went mad and s- hugged us and we all hugged one another and it was amazing. It's and an... that was what theatre is about. That's the best for me. But you didn't discover that for a while. You didn't discover um, that sort of theatre for I occasionally a while. would do a play that I cared passionately about. Yes. And when I l- later came to Shakespeare, I, d- I didn't get Shakespeare when I was young because I was the wrong type. But, but when I did, that was a passion because it is, he belongs to us mm. and every child is entitled to him. And that was my passion. It's another example of the, 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 the insidiousness of that lovey stereotype, isn't it? Yeah. Because what you do when you sign people up to that stereotype is you deny them access to the things you've Absolutely. just described, not just to the poetry, but to the relevance. Absolutely. To and the all, relevance as well. At the moment, with all the cutbacks, the one things that private schools are not cutting mm. are their arts and their lectures and their debates and all that. In the, in the, in the state schools, that's all going. So the gap grows. It's terrible. Mm. It's terrible. And in fact, talking about pendulum swinging and, and, and the perspective you have, you've, you've seen the class relationship with class with your profession change as well. It's swung back now to privilege, hasn't it? Whereas, well, they say that. They say that a bit. But the privileged lads are pretty knowing, actually. That's true, yes. If you think of all of them, they're pretty committed and they guys. Can act, and they can act. And they can act. There's no they doubt about act. that. Um but but when you were at RADA, by dint of having a, 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 a London accent, a Cockney accent, you were ostracised. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I couldn't give myself away. I spent years tacking around doing weekly rep and everything. I couldn't even get seen by anybody. So why I, did you stick with it? Oh, dogged thing. I didn't know what else to do, right. quite honestly. I didn't... I didn't... I could act, hmm. and I was useful for that, but I... I I didn't know that there was anything else I could do. I, I didn't dream that somebody like me could write. I write. Mm. I wrote my first book when I was seventy. You know, and I didn't think that's what that's what university does to yes, you. Yes, and private it education. Give, and private education. Yes. It gives you the right to be who you are. If you're like me, I mean, you know, and it was worse when I was young. You know, with those phrases like "little girls should be seen and not mm. heard" and. Mm. You know, know your place. My dad used to say that. Did to he me. really? Know your place, Sheila. Right. You know, and but I, you didn't. I didn't eventually, but in front of him, I did. <laughs> but I, but I, I don't know. I mean, I was lucky that I had slightly maverick parents, so that probably helped me. And the war probably helped me because it was so erratic and everybody's lives fell apart. But you'll find an awful lot of actors, their parents are either in the church mm. or army. Mm. Lots of people in the army who have travelled around, yes. been rootless. You know, if you say to me, "Where, do, where's your home?" I've no idea. Honestly, I don't know which of the places I would choose as right. my home. I say London because I've been here longest. Sure, but you've spent. But I was months. born on the Isle of Wight. Yeah, 
Yeah, and months on the road in rap Absolutely. films, doing stuff miles away but from I, home. But I love this country to death, and I, and I really want it to get better and stop behaving badly. You and me both. Um, the the sort of the, the next bit I'm interested in is this this move from being un, unfulfilled and underused to finding both fulfilment and and employment. Uh, the, I, mean, I mean, for the public, the rag trade would be a big milestone yes, that there. Was huge, but but yes. I think on stage, did it start to happen before that? Uh, Rattle of a Simple Man was, a, that was again, a Cockney prostitute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and somebody, Michael Codron, wonderful impresario, he was one of the new impresarios, because the whole of the West End was dominated by our tenants' hold. Yes, yes. You know, on they, the fitters, and you yeah. couldn't, people like me just couldn't get a look in. The same cycles Absolutely. and circles. You see it on the posters, actually, don't you? Michael Dennison and Dulcie Gray, yes. this and that, and that, and, and all Claire Bloom, Claire Bloom, and everything. Yes. And they, you had to be really lovely and and very ladylike. So and this, lovely, lovely. This grip began to loosen, that, and that coincided, did it, with people like Albert Finney and Peter O'Toole coming up through Rada? Yes. So you missed that. But it was mainly the Royal Court and did it. And, so, and Joan Littlewood, right? Because yes. she began casting people like me. And Harry Corbett and people like that. And Barbara in Windsor as well. And Barbara, they? yeah. yeah. I mean, completely she defined we could all play of them. Anything. And she was right. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, going back to the St. Joan, I managed to get an audition with Joan down at Stratford East because I worshipped her work, yeah. having watched it. And I did my St. Joan the Bell speech with tears running down my face. And I heard this laughter in the stars. <laughs> and I thought, what's going on? That's awfully rude. Anyway, she, she always wore a cap on her head and it, she came up and I, it's always a bad sign if it's pulled over her face. Right. And she said, darling, what are you doing? You're a clown. Oh, what gosh. are you doing? Gosh. Let's have some fun. And then for the first time in my life, I was led into doing an improvisation and I was made to feel I was funny and valuable and original. And, and it was such a break because one, I tried to conform I was very tall. I'd always worn flat shoes. I was a cot well, not cottony, sure. just horrible London vo yes. accent. I I I talk posh. I learned to talk to talk posh. I I dressed like I was supposed to dress as an actress and always looked dreadful. I wore hats and gloves when I went on the round of the agents and do you know what I mean? I you tried to desperately to be what yes. I was you expected thought they wanted. to be. Yes. And they did want you to be. Right. But you couldn't I mean, be I got that sacked quite. by the BBC for standing up for myself. I wanted to do something because I did loads and loads of sitcoms at one time. Now take my wife, mm. one was called. And <laughs> bed sit girl. You can imagine, can't you? Yes, I can. You can imagine. And I was a sort of floozy blonde. And there was a party at the BBC where they, the head of the light entertainment department said, oh, madam keeps turning stuff down, meaning me. Right. And I said, well, you keep giving me rubbish. And he said, right, well, I'll give you half an hour to do with what you like. So there was a marvellous man called Barry Took, yes. who was on the comedy thing. He said, well, do it, don't worry. And he knew about people that were coming out of um, Oxford and Cambridge, which was John and mm. Graham and mm. Peter Cook and all that. And we devised this show called Now Seriously at Sheila Hancock. And it went out very late at night. But then there was a sketch in it that I'd done in rep on, on I, I'd done in review yeah. in, on the stage, but it was very extreme, a woman hating everybody. Yes. And the director said, you can't do it, darling, it'll destroy your image. I said, what image? And he yeah. said, well, people like you and they won't want to see you. I said, well, I want to do it, please. And he said, well, I, I, I'm saying you can't. So I then went to the head of light entertainment and he said, well, if he says you can't, then you can't. And then, and then I went to Hugh Weldon, who was the head of the BBC. And I said, please, can I do it? And he said, I'll tell you what, you can do it in front of the studio audience. And if the studio audience like it, then it can stay in the show. And it went like a bomb. Right. And I didn't work for the BBC for 10 years. Because you'd put noses out of joint. Yeah, yeah. So the director's watching it, hating the fact that it's going down well. Yeah, yeah. So that, and I think, I, you, you would, there's a cute contradiction here, isn't there, Sheila, a bit? Because... You portray yourself. I've got images of you terrified before mm. you come on stage mm. and feeling that you don't fit mm. in and comparing yourself to other actresses and finding yourself wanting. Mm. 
But there are other elements of your story that Bloody portray good. fearlessness. I know. Fearlessness. I don't know that it's fearlessness because I do it anyhow. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I suppose that could be a wartime thing, couldn't it? That you had to. You you were frightened, but you still had to go to school with your helmet on and yeah. and, and be yeah. down the shelters, and you'd hear all this stuff going on overhead, and then you come up and just collect shrapnel. See, ah, oh, I've got a machine gun bullet. You know, because there's no option. You can't take a day off from the war. Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe it. Maybe. Maybe it's that. Yes. But I, I, I have friends who really relish life. I mean, I, I. I, I'm a joke. I, we had book club yesterday. I, I belong to this amazing book club, and I'm th- quite the most ignorant of all of them. They're all Rubbish. very well educated sure women, yeah. and I love being with them, and, that, and the, it's great. But but we cook a meal. Do you know what I mean? And I'm hopeless at that, and I get in such a state. If, I mean, it's as though the world's going to end. I'm so frightened that I'm going to do it badly, and. I don't know. It's fear of failure, is it? I don't know. I don't know. You're right. It is a contradiction. But I, I so envy those people who love everything. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yes, I do. But I often wonder whether or not they are as content inside as they appear to be outside. I don't mean that they're being fraudulent. I just mean that some people are just a little bit more open about their anxiety than no, others are. I think they some really, people are just living it. They cherish things much better. Do you know what I mean? And yes, yes, they I do. Le- they've they've decided that they're going to like things. I'm going to relish this moment. Yeah, and, going and they do. This. And yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not until at all superior about it. I, no, I genuinely envy them. Yes, I genuinely do because I'm gnawing my fingers, worrying about you know, something that might. I remember happen standing next. next to Millie Martin. We did the Night of a Hundred Stars, and the three of us. It was me, Millie, and somebody else, and Liz. Oh, I don't know, but we were doing a trio, <laughs> and I was quaking at the wings. Right, and she was going, mm, mm, mm. and I said, "Are you not scared, Millie?" She said, "I wouldn't be here if they didn't want me." It's a very and good philosophy, isn't it, though? It's and and she was brilliant, yes. and I was awful. Rubbish. I'm no, sure. truly. Well, but it doesn't touch the sides. It, other people's confidence doesn't... It, you can't just... I'm awfully it. good with for other people. Right, you are. If you needed a helping hand, if you were going to do an audition, yes, I'd get you through it. Yes, I bloody well would. I would. I would rehearse you. I'd go with you. I'd give you the right words just it's before you go. What I need to on. hear, but I would be fantastic at doing that. But it's not funny. Were, were you waiting? Did you know? And and I, that that during the the sort of the more difficult years, the earlier years, mm. did you feel that that there was. A, a light at the end of the tunnel did you think no. Of, no you really didn't no I didn't I honestly didn't think I was ever going to fit in I mean I, I remember being seen once I, I did separate tables and played by Terence mm. Rattigan and in the first one I played a model and I got you know hair pieces and lovely makeup and that was at Bromley Rep not the Rep now but a yeah. tatty one <laughs> and uh, anyway somebody was in from the John Penrose office and they summoned me to see the big man, the agent. And I put all my gear on and went there. And he, he, his face fell as I walked in. And he sat me under a lamp and said, well, the first thing we've got to do is a bit of plastic surgery. We've Good got to have that nose and all that. And do you know, that was absolutely acceptable then. It really was. I mean, we didn't, thank God now, yeah. hopefully an actor would say, fuck off, are you kidding with me? <laughs> you know, surgery. But now they're, they're standing up for themselves. But like I did, a, and that's a rather sweet thing happened when I did I did my play Rattle of a Simple Man. I yes. had huge success, lots of prizes and everything. And they did the film and Dion Cilento played they it. They didn't cast you. And do you know, Absolutely, I understood. I okay. didn't for one minute think that they would cast me right. because I didn't do films. Yes. I wasn't beautiful on film. I wasn't married to George, Sean Connery, all that. <laughs> Years later, <laughs> I got an invitation to go to Shepparton, I think it was, to have lunch with Muriel Box, right. who was the producer of okay. it. And she said, Sheila, I, I just wanted to meet you and say I'm sorry. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, I should have cast you in Rattle. She said it was, I, I gave in to the money people right. and the show the, and the film didn't work anyway. 
Um, and she said, it's always, whenever I've seen you lately, you know, because I was beginning to mm. do nice things, she said, I thought I didn't help her. I didn't help her. So How did that, that make you nice. feel? Was, was that vindicating? Or, or It was moving. Not, yes. Deeply yes, moving. Yes. yes. And, I, and, I, and I comforted him and I said, look, I didn't for one minute think that I'd get it. I really didn't. And as you say, you were starting to do nice things by now. Did it? Did it? You know that line in Gatsby about bankruptcy, where it says first slowly, then quickly. Is that yes. how? Is that how your success happened? Was it first slowly, then quickly? I don't count it as success. You see, I really, really don't. But yes, well, objectively, I've, I've I could list. The, I could look at your Wikipedia page, all the things you've done, all the awards, the yeah, nominations. Some, I mean, by some... most objective measures of success, it's the, I think it's a word that fits. I've kept working. I've kept yes, working. Yes, but also. Good work, you know, with, with a few exceptions, Some like take my wife. <laughs> yes. I now take my wife, and, and a terrible thing I did, um, the, what's the St. Trinian's? I did a oh, St. Trinian's gosh. thing yeah. where I dared to play the headmistress. I mean, Alistair Sim. I did, and I yeah. played it, and I don't know whether it was my choice or whether they made me, but with a Dutch accent. No. And I. And I and I went to the Dutch embassy to look at the accent and everything. And I can't believe it. Somebody sent an email recently, apparently, to a website saying, girls of the St. Trinians, why? Yes. And I said to my PA, just say, the money. <laughs> Um, but you also got lots of lots of, and you did. You managed to sort of fulfil all of your enthusiasms, really, didn't you? So you went to Broadway with entertaining Mr. Sloan. Yes. You, you. I think. You but got that a, was that was a disastrous flop. That, was it? It was it, it was a, 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 a success d'estime. Yeah. But I mean, it was the the review. I it's etched on my heart. <laughs> Throw this British cesspit back in the Atlantic. Right. It said. I mean, because it it's so shocked them because Broadway well, it, I mean, was still very proper. And yeah, we were so doing... I, I'm looking at the year. I thought I'd, I thought I'd misread it by a decade. I presumed it was, it was 75, but it was 65. Yeah, it shocked them rigid. Well, it and then do. the Greenwich Voice, which mm. was an alternative newspaper, took us up. And people like Tennessee Williams and all those people came and saw it several times. So it was the best experience. And then I got nominated for a Tony, yes. obviously, because they felt ashamed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it, we had a ball because we were these wicked people with this dirty play. Did, did and did you start being kind to yourself? Did you? Is there a point where you thought? I know you've already said you don't consider yourself to have been a success, but you must have acknowledged that you were doing something right at some point. You must have. I mean, after Joan Littlewood gave you your wings, as it were, you you must have. Yeah, felt... but the trouble is that you you have a, a, a thing where things are going well. And the next thing you do is a disaster. So you're back to square one. Yes. That's the nature of the business. That's what I'm always saying when people ask me if they want to go on the stage. Mm. I say you've got to be constantly able to pick yourself up and carry on if you want to earn a living yes. at it. Because you can never, I mean, even Olivier was terrified he wouldn't get another job, apparently. Well, I, I wonder whether you're psychologically quite well equipped for that, then, with the with the tensions that we've talked about. I think about. I am, because I don't have any pretensions. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I I'm do. not grand at all. So yes. I don't, I don't, I could quite easily go back to living in a bed set. I wouldn't mind. I, I really, I, honestly, I, genuinely I, wouldn't. I, no, I believe you. And you don't. You don't have a sense of entitlement, do you? Oh, God, no. Not even a tiny one. Oh, God, no. no. Really, I don't. But on the other, somebody asked me the other day, who has most impressed me? Hmm. And, you know, I realise I'm not easily impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of anybody. Attlee was the only person I could think of. And Bevan, yes. way back. But I couldn't, and that was only because I, I encountered them both in... The, a way that was, that was so shock, amazing, but it, but I, I, I'm not impressed by people. No, you know some most actors, if big stars come, or if yeah. you're working yeah. with big stars, like when I worked with Bette Davis, yes, everybody was oh gosh, we're working with Bette Davis. I to me, she was. I was just fascinated by her. And I wasn't at all frightened to say, you're right, that was good, that bit, or yeah, yeah. whatever. Do you know I what I mean? I bet she loved that, didn't she? I would have thought. Do you know, thought. she did. Yeah. She did. She, well, I once, I, she did a close-up, and I did the lines off. 
And it was amazing. She did her usual cigarette business and it was just pure Bette Davis. And I just said, oh, God, that was so good, Miss Davis. And she said, oh, thank you, honey. The highest compliment I ever get is printed. <laughs> you know, so, I, and you thought, my God, no, yeah, nobody no is ever, too frightened. No one to bothers say, anymore. Taking exactly. Her, they don't say, presuming. you're really rather glorious. I, I want to get to the books, but before we do that, for, for, I mean, it is a ridiculous gamut that, uh, of everything <laughs> that you've done. Um, and we have no time to run oh, we're it. We're believing coming out of different holes, so I keep working. But what, but but are there are there particular highlights for you, or does it? Because or is that actually a silly question? Because where do we start? We, we go from Annie to Cabaret. We 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 we, we do the. Well, do you know I, I'm, I'm enjoying being old. I'm I'm mm. enjoying, not having to do a show every night. Yes. <laughs> and people are, have recently been saying such lovely things to me like you are um people that i respect because i love your program and i love your rage thank you i love it <laughs> um and so i was deeply flattered that you asked me to be That's on i'm not impressed by you no i should hope not i but i like you <laughs> thank you, do you know, and i'm yes. interested in you yes but do you know do you know what i mean some people spend their whole time saying oh my god i saw so and so no. and they blew their nose or yeah. they said hello and even Dare I say the king and and people like that? Uh, Where does me, that come from for you then? Where I do don't know. I have no idea, because I should be servile coming from my background. Maybe pubs, maybe my dad greeting everybody. A great uh, equaliser. Yeah. You know, he was a very good landlord. Very good landlord. Yes. But great fun. And didn't matter who he was. Lovely to the old guy who was there all day. He was lovely to the wives who. Got him. But also, he's the he's the lord of his manor. Yeah. So you grew up oddly, as as, as, as the princess. Yes, <laughs> sort of. I mean, not in any as sense of. Sarah, yeah. But in terms of, I'm, I could not be I, in this building. I could not be any yes. safer or more important. That's I'm the daughter true. of the landlord. Those poor ladies in the ladies' bar. Yeah. They used to because yeah. I used to be allowed in this thing at the back where they had their port and lemons port and lemon and i used to do the whole of snow white and the seven little people <laughs> <laughs> and of course because i was a landlord's they daughter they anything. couldn't say do you well, mind go, excuse go me away. <laughs> we're, we're having to a have drink a here <laughs> it's a funny one though isn't it because you clear, I, I honestly don't know where it comes from but honest to god i'm i'm do you know what? i i admire people's guts i admire people mm. but i'm not daunted mm. by them and I get angry with people who are daunted mm. by people do you know what I mean? I like, think politically it's 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 absolutely tragic isn't it, it when is. people think, I mean it's like that know your place line that you heard from your absolutely. dad at that, because people honestly and that's how some truly awful people can end up absolutely. receiving deference Can from, you imagine from, what we'll end up with if we don't have a king and queen? No, <laughs> but it, no but that's it, a very good point actually but I, I, well, I did a lovely thing that the Princess of Wales, is she, yes, mm. uh, organised at Westminster Abbey. And it was at the time when we were watching the, the terrible things that had been going on at 10 Downing Street. Mm. And the, 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 the church, the cathedral, was full of people who looked after children in some way or other. Okay. Charities, they were from all over the country, in Scotland and Wales and everything fabulous atmosphere fabulous atmosphere and the princess looked glorious mm. and, and we were going to meet her a few of us because we'd done a bit of filming and there was a lady next to me who was a midwife who works for virtually nothing with people who can't mm. afford it and all that and she said why are you very nervous I said darling why you're every bit as important as her yes and she wants to meet you yes that's why you're standing here, because she knows what you've done and she wants to say thank you. And indeed, that's exactly what the princess did. She's sure. frightfully good with people. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And she looked glorious and it was just lovely. But that's... And I... I, I don't get it. I, I, I think it's a shame. Yes. Because they are trying to move into something different. Right. That we still love crawling to people the mad, the, yeah the madness of it all what it, why do we do that i don't know why i think do we derive a bit of we mistake hierarchy for stability if you know where you slot into a system then you feel 
wrongly, but it, it gives you a sense of st stability. Maybe. It keeps the madness at bay. You know, the chaos, Maybe. the chaotic nature of existence can be but kept at bay by the thought, no, I fit here and she fits there and he fits here. Yeah. Maybe. I don't That's know. like that sketch. The the, 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 yes, it is, isn't it? Yeah, the dog teased me. But, it, but, it, but now what is disturbing is that the values are becoming distorted, yes. aren't they? Yes, you can become so. a famous person on the web because you've got a big penis or something. Yes, so or, I hear. Do you know yes, what I mean? I do. Or you... Yeah, I, I wonder if it was always a little bit like that, though. I, you've all, people it just have, wasn't so much. Well, we've always been able to achieve celebrity for spurious reasons, but yes. just not, not, as, not as easily or as bigly as, as you can now. When, when then did you start sort of spreading your wings because you mentioned you wrote your first novel at 70 people yeah. will also know you from from uh, uh just a minute on radio four and doing lots of other things that actually now that i've listened to you that they speak more to someone who perhaps had been to university or had been to it's as if quite late in life you you became an undergraduate almost well, right? I, did, I think that's true i did an open university i didn't ah, do the okay. whole course but right. i did um, some of these early courses when the children were young and i uh I'm avid to learn. I'm mm. avid to learn. And I love educating people. You see, you come into that category. And I, I, I love that that I, I, I am daunted by. Right. Not, no, I'm not. I'm impressed by okay. great knowledge. Learning. And I respect yes. hugely. And I want to meet yes. people like that. And I want a bit of them to rub off on me. Do you know what I mean? And is that how you found yourself in those sorts of circles? Then? I suppose is it? it is, yes. And then someone at some point said, have you ever thought of writing a novel? And you said... Yeah, somebody did yes. say that. <laughs> and it was, it was writing about the tour, about yes. the Royal Shakespeare tour. So a, a, a publisher said, that sounds like... I, was, I just was telling him, you know, the cast were so amazing and, and the things that happened were so amazing. And he said, I think there's a book in that. Mm. Um, and and there said, was. Well, I don't do how many books have you written now? I f five, I think, yes. five. The most late, the, the most recent of which is old rage, which is which is a misnomer, <laughs> yes, isn't it? Yes. Really, I think you were nodding to Dylan Thomas as opposed to yes, a sort of angry old woman type of yes, which you're not. I'm not really no, no. I'm not. I, 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 well, I I do get angry. Yeah, but about good things, it's not a sort of inchoate no. fury. Well, there's another tension here, isn't there? Because you 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 don't care about status we've established no, you're not you're I not don't a, think so, but, but no. you do worry about what people think but you worry about what a, a sort of unidentified person thinks as opposed to a real person because i know because we talked about stage fright and we've talked yeah. about not fitting in and 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 i know that i've read one interview where you were a bit uncomfortable with the interviewer mentioning some work that you did with Ukrainian refugee children because you didn't want to come across uh, as being holier than thou. Yeah, or, but yeah. So you're worrying about someone else's opinion there yeah. when you really shouldn't be. And yet you can stand in a congregation with members of the royal family telling the person next to you to get over themselves. <laughs> yeah. That's strange. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't add up. That's, <laughs> that's true. I, I am even less added up now. Than I was when I walked in the room, and and when you write a particularly old rage, you 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 put it all out there, don't you? You you you, you know you. I believe in being honest. Yes. Yes. I've just written. I do a monthly column for the Prospect magazine. Yes, I know. And I just done one about the royal family fessing up. Yes. That I'm not a Republican. Um, I'm not not a Republican, but I do like the, the present role. And as you say, be careful what you wish for. Yes. In the con, you know, uh, absolutely. The, the, because what we might end up. And particularly with when you look at the sleaze that's happening in politics, mm. it's just nice to have something a bit fresher. And Did, you know, and there are always people who say, "Oh, yeah, but what about the fact of the inequality and all that?" Yeah, I know all that. Yeah. But if you're a little girl who lived through the war, where the princesses were nice to you and and sang songs to you on the radio and all that, then it's hard to shake that off. It's hard to forget about it. You're also quite hard on yourself in the book, particularly on your mothering, your your, your period as a mother. Do, 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 does yeah. that does that cathartic writing that? Are you are you trying to make sense of stuff that's gone? No, on? I'm trying to be honest because yeah. you know I I anything I write goes past my girls and I I have to be honest about it, and they have turned out to be really wonderful mothers yes. as a result. So it hasn't destroyed them, but. Um, I, I just I think when you write, you've I think in life generally you have 
you have to be honest, even if it reflects badly on yourself, I think. Yes, otherwise, what's the point? Well, it, people don't believe you when it's important that they should, if you do that, you know. Um, we're nearly out of time. I, I, I just cut, struck by a couple of things. The first is that you don't... I've, I've interviewed a lot of actors. Um, they don't have that much in common, oddly, actors. No. You'd, you'd think that they would, wouldn't you, from the outside? Yeah. But you don't really have a look at me, Jean, do you? You don't... I mean, no. uh, the only point at which I thought you might was when you were telling me about doing Snow White in the <laughs> in the ladies' bar at, the, at your dad's pub, but you yeah. don't... You don't need the adulation by any stretch no. of the imagination no i honestly don't so i i i really don't think i do and i'm i'm worried by it sometimes because people do say lovely things to me mm. and say i'm an inspiration and all that and i and i need them to know that i hobbled here this morning <laughs> i'm not this amazing woman who climbs mountains i'm actually somebody getting old and bits are falling off and I'm not enjoying a lot of that. So, you know, I I know sometimes when I've been in pain and somebody comes, and you know, often when you do a broadcast or something, they say, I mean, it's very lighthearted. Do keep it light, Sheila. Yeah. I mean, you know, we don't, don't want any serious stuff because people, you know, <laughs> and you and you get this person like me coming on and saying, oh, what a wonderful day and everything. And you're sitting there going, oh, Christ, my knee hurts. <laughs> and you think, oh, be quiet, you stupid actress. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> That's what I feel. Um, and I, 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 I can't believe I'm asking you this question, but I, I sense that there's still some stuff you'd want to do. Oh, God, you? yes. Like what? Oh, God, yes. Oh, I don't know where to begin. I'm in such a panic about, about what the state I'm of the world. Well, I want to do more classical music. I'm, I'm so upset, because it's such a passion in my life, I'm so upset that children are being taken more and more mm. away from it. Sheku was on mm. doing Desert Island Discs, and he was talking about that, you know, because his family have done so much to open up yes. to certain people. But it's a joy that I want everybody to have the opportunity of turning down, if mm. necessary. Yes, of course. Um, and so I, any work I do, I want to try and do that, that encourages people to at least try it. Um, I'd love to do, just for my own fun, I'd love to do a couple of tiny parts. I've done a couple of small parts in wonderful television series, and I've been proud to be part of them. But I've only had about a week's work on them, and that yes. suits me fine, right, yes. <laughs> quite honestly. I'd love that, um, just, just for my fun. And also, if we start doing some serious plays, which I'm hoping that we will now be doing some more campaigning stuff, yes. because it's, it's going so well. Um, for my own satisfaction, I need to learn more about classical music. I need to know more about art. I, there's a painting that I desperately want to see that I've got a print of, and it's in a gallery in America, and I don't know whether I can get over and see it. Do you know what I mean? Silly I little things. I, I had a wonderful weekend just recently that I planned that um, a friend of mine is a young conductor for the Bournemouth Phil, and Sheku was playing a, a Shostakovich thing. And they invited me to the rehearsal. <gasps> Darling, I was... But talk about worshipping people. <laughs> I was like a terrible fan. I was like... All these musicians, all they wanted to do was go home and have their sandwiches. You know? <laughs> but I'm there going, oh, I said, marvellous. Wasn't that wonderful bit, that phrase? Blah, blah. Anyway, and then I, I travelled to where they were doing a, po a concert the following night, and I was there at the concert. So I, I was... Like a fan, like yes. a pop fan. Oh, I love that. And I want to do more of that. I want to do more of that. I want to be do more going to wonderful events. So so constantly conscious of how much there is to learn. To learn. And how to much learn. there is to do. Absolutely. The books to be read. And, yes. the, and written. Yeah. Well, I know I don't think I'll be able to write it. I haven't got time. No. You, 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 I mean, it's that awful thing, you know, like the... the, the um, the book club, they, if we have a toast, they, it's our 18th year, I think. Here's to the next 18. And I'm oh, thinking, I I'm sorry. <laughs> I <laughs> well, don't think no. so. Well, I disagree. Well, I mean, <laughs> who knows if anyone can. Yeah. Here is. That's it. Sheila Hancock, thank you. Well, thank you.